Gallipoli, like the Somme and Passchendaele, has come to symbolize the waste and futility of the fighting during the Great War. The infamous campaign, which was largely the brainchild of Winston Churchill, was intended to force Turkey from the war and open up supply lines to Russia. But in these aims, it failed. And at what a cost. During the nine-month campaign, 46,000 Allied troops lost their lives. This, then, was Gallipoli, the tactical masterstroke that became a tragic and bloody sideshow. The Straits of the Dardanelles, which separate Europe from Asia, are one of the world's most strategically important waterways. The Straits link the waters of the Mediterranean with the Sea of Marmara, on whose northern shores sits the city of Istanbul, which in 1914 was called Constantinople and was the capital of the Ottoman Empire. From Istanbul, the narrow Bosphorus Straits link the Sea of Marmara to the Black Sea, thus offering potential supply routes to Russia through its Black Sea ports of Odessa and Sevastopol. In 1915, the Dardanelles became the scene of one of the most ambitious and controversial campaigns of the First World War as British Empire and French soldiers and sailors took part in the first major amphibious operation in modern warfare. It was a costly and bloody failure, and the Gallipoli campaign became Turkey's outstanding victory of the First World War. The Dardanelles Straits are guarded on the west by the rugged Gallipoli Peninsula which extends from Buller in the north for 47 miles to Cape Helles and the historic fortress of Sed El Bar. Three miles across at Buller, its narrowest point, and 12 miles at its broadest at Kilid Bar, the peninsula is a natural fortress made of chalk and sandstone hills separated by deep ravines carved out by the winter rains. There are few beaches suitable for military landings, and they are all overlooked by steep chalk cliffs or the dominating slopes of the coastal ranges. Dividing the Gallipoli Peninsula from Asiatic Turkey run the swift southward flowing waters of the Dardanelles Straits. These flow for 35 miles until they reach the Aegean Sea at Cape Helles. Averaging two miles across, the Straits reach their narrowest point of just under one mile at the narrows that separate the fortifications at Kilid Bar and Charnak. Britain and her allies, France and Russia, all had designs on Turkish possessions. Britain wanted to guarantee the security of the Suez Canal and also secure control of the newly discovered oil fields in the Persian Gulf. France wanted to increase its influence in Syria and the Lebanon, while Russia wanted to annex Constantinople, take control of the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, and gain sea access to the Mediterranean. In late 1914, Britain and France were desperately looking for a way to break the growing stalemate of trench warfare, which was frustrating attempts to drive the Germans back on the Western Front. In January 1915, they received a plea from Russia, which was fighting Turkey in the Caucasus, for an operation that would divert Turkish attention. In response, the British cabinet agreed to the proposal from the young, enthusiastic Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, that obsolete pre-dreadnought-class battleships, which could not be used as part of the British Grand Fleet, should be used to break through the Dardanelles Straits. The naval offensive was really put together as a way of circumventing the bloodletting that was taking place on the Western Front. If Constantinople could be taken, then the Allies could knock away the soft underbelly of the German Axis power and hopefully win the war more quickly. An attack in the Eastern Mediterranean would divert attention from the Western Front and would also divert the Austro-Hungarian alliance from the gigantic battles which were taking place on the Russian front. 
Although previous military studies had suggested that a purely naval operation could not work without land operations to secure control of the Gallipoli Peninsula, Churchill gained the support of Lord Kitchener, Secretary of State for War, and pushed through his scheme. Kitchener saw the need to secure the straits once the fleet had passed through, to ensure that supplies to the fleet could be maintained. Despite the intense opposition of the British Army in France, he ordered the 29th British Division to stand by for the Dardanelles campaign, along with the two divisions of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps that were training in Egypt. Churchill committed the Royal Naval Division, made up of surplus naval ratings and Royal Marines, while the French offered both a naval squadron and a French corps of 18,000 colonial troops and units of the French Foreign Legion. On the 10th of March, Kitchener appointed General Sir Ian Hamilton to command this 75,000 strong force. It's difficult when we assess Sir Ian Hamilton today because we have to look at him through the prism of, of the, the failure of, of Gallipoli. But we've got to remember that the Hamilton of, of the spring of 1915 was regarded by his contemporaries in a very different light. He was one of the leading intellectual soldiers of the British Army. He had an immense amount of, of active service, and Hamilton was, was an obvious choice. He was also available. Hamilton was actually the best man they had. Hamilton's problem was that he was sent out by Kitchener, not knowing what the aim was, and really he was given a second, third, fourth eleven. The cream had gone to the Western Front. What was left? was uh, anything that could be cobbled together. And in every respect, it was a raw, amateur outfit. Preliminary Royal Naval bombardments in November 1914 on the outer forts guarding the entrance to the Straits at Cape Hellas alerted Turkey to the possibility of an Allied attack in the Dardanelles, and frantic improvements were made to coastal defenses. The bombardments were resumed in February, and on the 18th of March 1915, 16 battleships of the Anglo-French navies attempted to steam through the straits. It was a complete disaster. The British fishing trawlers, which had been converted for use as minesweepers, were not powerful enough to cope with the strong currents, and they missed a single row of 20 mines that had been laid in Erinkuyu Bay. Consequently, three battleships, two British and one French, were sunk, and three more were crippled. The fleet withdrew, not knowing that the Turkish guns protecting the straits had fired off almost all of their heavy ammunition. Both Admiral de Robeck, who commanded the operation, and Hamilton, who was an observer on his battleship, quickly became convinced of the futility of a purely naval operation. After the disastrous naval attack, Admiral de Robeck actually lost his nerve. He was heard to say, I suppose this will be the end of me. And although his chief of staff, the fiery Commodore Roger Keyes, was all for pressing on the next day, de Robeck faltered. Had the battleships got through to Constantinople, it was quite clear from the reports at the time. There was an enormous panic uh, among the Turkish government in Constantinople. And even today, contemporary Turkish historians believe that the government would have surrendered. Despite Churchill's protests, the men on the spot decided upon a land operation to seize the peninsula in order to allow the Navy to get through. They were supported in this by Kitchener and by the first sea lord Fisher. Hamilton planned that the main landings would be made on a series of beaches around the southern tip of the peninsula at Cape Hellas, while Lieutenant General Birdwood's Anzac Corps would land at Zed Beach, north of the Gaba Tepe promontory, and advance across the Midos Plain to the western shore of the Narrows, and cut off any reinforcements reaching the beaches to the south. To achieve surprise, the Royal Naval Division would pretend to land at Boulaire at the northern end of the peninsula, while the French would land at Kumkale 
near the site of Homer's Troy on the Asiatic shore. It was an ambitious plan, cobbled together in five weeks of frantic preparation. Ships and stores were gathered from all over the Mediterranean, and every seaport was full of rumors of the proposed invasion. The transports carrying the soldiers of Hamilton's Mediterranean Expeditionary Force assembled in Mudros Harbor on the island of Lemnos. Meanwhile, the Turkish forces also made preparations to defend the peninsula. The German general Limon von Sanders was given command of the Turkish forces on the peninsula and he anticipated that the landings would be made on the Asiatic shore or at Bulaire. The Turkish defenders, if you take a picture of them, look like a raggle-taggle army, um, unshaven, uncouth-looking, poorly dressed. But actually, if you scrape away at the surface, what you've got there is somebody that's fighting for his homeland, who's well-equipped, um, although the Turks lacked um, artillery pieces, the rest of their equipment was at least adequate for the job. They had good defensive positions, they were highly motivated, they were well organized and well commanded by the Germans. So what you actually have is quite a formidable enemy for the um, Allies to try and overcome. After a number of delays, the landings finally took place on the 25th of April, 1915. Hamilton's plan succeeded brilliantly in gaining tactical surprise and totally deceived Lehman von Sanders, who had placed only two of his six divisions on the peninsula. The first landings took place at 5 a.m. at Zed Beach, north of Gaba Tepe. The plan was for the three infantry brigades of Major General W.T. Bridges' 1st Australian Division to conduct a silent landing before dawn to seize the high ground of Chunuk Bear in the north. They were then to establish themselves in an arc extending from this point to Gaba Tepe in the south. The following Australian brigades would pass through this force across the Midos Plain and seize the low hill of Mal Tepe. Behind them, Major General Sir Alexander Godley's New Zealand and Australian Division would be landed as a reserve. Nothing went according to plan. The Australians found themselves on the wrong beach a mile too far to the north. This would become infamous as Anzac Cove. Instead of the Midos Plain, they were confronted with a mad tangle of broken ridges and ravines. It was one of the least defended pieces of coastline, yet the small number of Turkish defenders resisted fiercely before being driven inland. Even though there was tremendous individual initiative shown, uh, the first Australian brigade commander ashore decided that because he had been landed too far to the north, he would change the plan. And so he sent the next brigade to land to the south, to the low ground, instead of where it was supposed to go, towards Chunuk Bear, the high ground. And so right from the outset, the critical piece of ground that you needed to have to guarantee success was lacking in soldiers. The 35-year-old Colonel Mustafa Kemal, commanding the Turkish Reserve Division, heard reports of a landing at Gaba Tepe and, disregarding orders, immediately set forth with his leading regiment and ordered the other two regiments to follow on as quickly as possible. He reached the heights of Chunuk Bear at mid-morning and immediately counterattacked down the slopes towards Anzac Cove. Because of the Australian change of plan, Kemal attacked at the weakest part of the Anzac line. It was also the most critical, because the series of crests climbing up the ridge to Chunuk Bear dominated the landing beaches. The disorganized brigades of the Australian division found themselves caught out by an enemy they thought had retreated. Throughout the day, 
the Australians and the Reserve New Zealand Brigade were thrown in to stabilize the beachhead, which had gained about a thousand yards of ground inland on a frontage of just over two miles. All through the day, Kemal's regiments launched a series of counterattacks, and Turkish snipers picked off anyone who stood up to see what was going on. By nightfall, the critical heights were in Turkish hands, and both Anzac and Turk were intermingled along the ridge that had become the front line. Hamilton ordered the Anzacs to dig in and hold on until relieved by the advance of his forces in the south. One man's initiative, one man's change of plan, and despite the enthusiasm and the willingness of the troops, Anzac became a grim battle to hang on by their fingernails. Ashmead Bartlett, the official war correspondent with Hamilton's force, wrote an account that gave a glorious picture of Anzac's success. It spoke of citizen soldiers who could be totally cavalier and ill-disciplined out of the line, but natural soldiers in battle. The reality ashore on Anzac Day was rather different. The Anzac Corps was potentially very good. We're talking about magnificent raw material here. But the officers did not know their, their, their business. They'd simply not been in uniform long enough. The same was true of the non-commissioned officers. So what would tend to happen is that the, the Anzacs, uh, at least initially, could break down very quickly into a disorganized mob. Individually, very brave men. It would take the trial and error of the Gallipoli campaign to begin to mold it into the professional fighting force that would confirm the Anzac reputation on the Western Front. In Australia and New Zealand, the public accepted Bartlett's dispatches as proof of the accomplishments of their boys. And so, mythic deeds were cemented as fact, and the Anzac legend was born. The landings by Major General Hunter Weston's 29th British Division, which landed at V, W, X, Y and S beaches, were almost completely unopposed. However, at W Beach, the small band of Turkish defenders held their fire until the Lancashire Fusiliers reached the water's edge and then let loose a thunderous volley. The three Turkish platoons, numbering only 150 men, inflicted over 500 casualties on the Allied attackers. Gradually, though, the Lancashires gained control and edged inland, earning six Victoria Crosses as they did so. Matters were worse at V Beach, where the converted merchant steamer River Clyde was successfully beached just below the battered fortress walls of Sed El Bar. The problem with the River Clyde is that it is an experiment with getting troops ashore in an armoured landing craft. And this is the first time it's been tried. And we get it wrong. The, the exit points are too small. We can only get single columns of, of troops off the River Clyde. Instead of being uh, able to open the doors of having the infantry rush out en masse, a la 1944, they come ashore in dribs and drabs. And it's a very easy business for, for Turkish defenders, the Turkish machine gunners, uh, because they know where the, the troops are going to emerge from the River Clyde. They machine gun them in very, very large numbers indeed. The extraordinary thing is that the British troops continue to pour forth from the River Clyde, even though they're aware that it's virtually certain death. The Munster Fusiliers and the Hampshires were shot to pieces by the outnumbered but determined Turks as they ran down the ramps and tried to reach the shore. The Royal Dublin Fusiliers suffered the same fate as they tried to land in ships' cutters. British attempting to land at V and W beaches faced determined opposition, well-sighted defences, wire both below the water and on the beach itself, and machine guns on the cliffs at either end of both beaches, which could fire along the beach in enfilade, which is desperate for troops making a linear advance. 
They were also handicapped by the fact that they were using landing techniques which were Napoleonic. By nightfall, the bridgehead at W Beach was being expanded, but opportunities had been lost. The force at Y Beach had been evacuated, despite having sent patrols into Krithia, and despite the prospect of seizing Hunter Weston's tactical objective of Achi Baba, the low hill that dominated the open plateau to the south. By late April, Hamilton found that he had his force ashore, but had not yet gained the planned first day objectives. The Anzac Corps was hemmed into an impossible piece of ground, disorganized and unable to break out. The best prospects were in the south at Hellas, but here the low hill of Achi Baba had to be captured before it was possible for the British and French forces to advance up the peninsula. More worrying still, was the bulk of the Kilid Bar Plateau that stood behind Achi Baba and presented an even more serious obstacle to the invading force. In late April and early May 1915, Hunter Weston mounted a series of badly coordinated frontal attacks using all available forces at the Turkish positions in front of Achi Baba. Some ground was gained but a lack of artillery and determined Turkish defense threw back each attack. Turkish losses were also heavy, as they in turn mounted equally badly organized counterattacks. With both sides exhausted and short of men and ammunition, the position soon degenerated into the appalling stalemate of trench warfare. Hunter Weston attacked again on the 4th of June, but after an early success, the Turks counterattacked and drove the Allies back to where they had begun. Hunter Weston showed his lack of experience and inability to coordinate an effective battle. And you see this series of ill-coordinated frontal attacks in daylight, which simply meant men were killed to no purpose. And after doing it once, you would expect that he would have learnt from that experience, but he didn't. He did the same thing time after time after time. Hunter Weston was a man that was very green. He was learning on the job. And yes, of course he makes mistakes, but he is under-resourced, he's lacking information, he's lacking all of the real requirements that a commander should have at his disposal if he is to make success of a battle. The Anzac Corps perimeter was also in a state of siege. Liman von Sanders was ordered to drive the invaders into the sea. And on the 19th of May, the Turks launched a massive attack all along the Anzac Line. They were met with withering fire that left Turkish dead covering no man's land. In the summer heat, conditions became impossible in both front lines. Flies fed on the dead, and men gagged and vomited at the smell. On the 24th of May, an armistice was held to bury the dead, but there were simply too many. At best, bodies were tumbled into shell holes or gullies and covered with a thin coating of earth. By midsummer 1915, Hamilton realized that his forces at Helles and at Anzac were all but spent. He referred sadly in his diaries to the beautiful battalions of April, all gone, all wasted. He knew that a deadlock had set in. The British had actually gone to this operation without any clear thought about what would happen if it actually did degenerate into attritional trench warfare, and the logistic apparatus simply wasn't in place to sustain this operation. Hamilton was critically short of all the resources needed to mount a major land campaign. He lacked heavy artillery, 
and for periods his field guns were limited to two rounds per day. Small arms ammunition was also in short supply, and there were no hand grenades, of which the Turks had a plentiful supply. There were no field telephones, and no signal cable, barbed wire, corrugated iron, or building supplies. It's quite easy for the British to supply themselves on the Western Front. Um, in Flanders or on the Somme, they are 24 hours away from the factories that produce the shells. Of course, in Gallipoli, they're at least two weeks away. So you've got this very long journey to get the resources where they're required in the Mediterranean. The haste in mounting the operation now showed in the collapse of the administrative arrangements. The medical evacuation plan broke down during the landing, and there was a lack of supplies and resources needed to deal with a growing number of dysentery cases, caused by inadequate water supplies and lack of fresh food. Churchill paid for the debacle at Gallipoli when he was removed from the Admiralty in May 1915. The War Council was reconstituted as the Dardanelles Committee by the British government, and Hamilton was offered both supplies of ammunition and five newly raised British divisions. The front at Hellas was deadlocked, but reconnaissance at Anzac suggested a way to mount a new offensive. At Anzac, the New Zealand Mounted Rifles of Godley's New Zealand and Australian Division held the northern flank and a series of outposts along the beach at Fisherman's Hut. Reconnaissance patrols reported that the foothills leading up to the high ground of Chunuk Bear were weakly defended. It was felt that it might be possible to make a night approach and to seize the coastal hill range of Sari Bear, which was centered on Chunuk Bear. By doing a night attack through the foothills up onto the high ground and seizing the high ground, it would outflank the Turkish defences and then having outflanked the Turkish defences, they could advance across to the Narrows and achieve the original objective of the landing. To continue their advance across Chinook Bear to the other side of the peninsula, the eastern side, would of course also had the advantage of cutting the lines of communication coming south to the Turkish troops around Cape Hellas. Chinook Bear was a place that the Turks had to hold, and it was there that, that Birdwood and his Anzac officers decided that they could fight a, a, a decisive battle with the Turks. Birdwood's Anzac Corps were given the key role. It would be mounted in early August, at the same time as a new amphibious landing north of Anzac at Suvla Bay, using the three British divisions organized into nine corps under Lieutenant General Stopford on what was his first operational command. The Suvla landings have uh, gone down in mythology as a landing that was designed to assist the Anzac Corps seize the high ground of Chunuk Bear. That wasn't their purpose at all. The purpose of the Suvla landings was to seize a winter base for operations. Quite clearly, the Gallipoli campaign was not going to be over in a week or month. There was this going to be this long, deliberate campaign, and with the winter approaching, it was essential to get a deep water harbour, and so uh, almost as an afterthought, it was decided that in conjunction with the Anzac breakout to seize the high ground, there would be the Suvla landing to achieve a winter base, and then once that was done, to assist the Anzacs where they could. At Anzac, Birdwood's planning was faulty from the beginning. The critical feature was Chunuk Bear, and experience showed that only veteran troops could handle the conditions faced on the perimeter. However, Birdwood used the 1st Australian Division, together with an additional light horse brigade acting as infantry, to mount a series of feints along the Anzac front line at the Neck, Quinn's Post, and at Lone Pine. 
the feint at Lone Pine, was mounted on the evening of the 6th of August. This attack succeeded, but at a, an horrific cost. With more than 2,000 Australian casualties. The Turks had actually dug themselves in, into underground bunkers. There were heavy logs on top. And the Australians had to literally tear the, the roofs of the, these bunkers. And a lot of the fighting was actually conducted underground. A, a bloody battle, but a victory. The other feints failed. This included the desperate suicidal attack of the Australian light horse at the neck, which, unlike the account given in the film Gallipoli, was not failed, not because of the stupidity of purple-faced, red-tabbed, monocle-wearing, buck-teeth British staff officers, but of the failure of the Australian staff to synchronise their watches with the guns of the fleet and with the artillery supporting them. They were seven minutes out, and when the barrage stopped, there was a pregnant pause of seven minutes in which the Turks could be seen 50 yards away putting machine guns onto their parapet, and the attacks still went in. They were ordered to go ahead in cold blood, and they were slaughtered. 375 of the 600 attackers became casualties. The principal attacks on Chunuk Bear were carried out by Godley's Australian and New Zealand Division, reinforced by the 13th British Division and the 29th Indian Brigade. New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade and the 40th British Infantry Brigade seized the foothills in a series of brilliant, carefully coordinated night attacks with rifle and bayonet. This was followed by the advance of two columns. The left assaulting column, commanded by Major General Cox of the 29th Indian Brigade and including Brigadier John Monash's 4th Australian Brigade, was ordered to seize the high point of Koja Chairman Tepe which was also known as Point 971. Overton's patrols had reported that the sheer cliff face made such an attempt impossible, but Birdwood persisted. The attempt failed, with Australians being sniped to a standstill in the foothills, and the 29th Indian Brigade slowly making their way forward up the slopes to Hill Q, which linked Point 971 with Chunuk Bear. The right assaulting column consisted of the New Zealand Infantry Brigade under Brigadier Earl Johnston. It passed through the New Zealand mountains and made its way up the slopes on the night of the 6th and 7th of August. Daylight found it on Rhododendron Ridge, missing one of its battalions, but with the crest of Chunuk Bear less than 600 yards above it. Had they but known it, the crest of Chunuk Bear was all but deserted. There was a, a platoon of Turks there. And a German staff officer arrived there at the same time, looked down, saw this advancing column, got this platoon to start firing, and the exhausted soldiers who had been climbing all night went to ground. The brigade commander, instead of pushing the New Zealanders on, decided to wait until the rest of his brigade was up there. So that by mid-morning, when he finally attacks, Turkish reinforcements have arrived, lining the crest of the hill, and the attack is shot to pieces. The following night, the 8th of August, Johnston renewed the attack on Chunuk Bear with the Wellington Infantry Battalion commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Malone and two British battalions. The Wellington seized the heights, which apart from a machine gun post had been abandoned because of the British artillery fire. And for the first time since uh, some of the soldiers on the 25th of April, they can see the narrows. They've got the high ground, they've outflanked the Anzac perimeter. The door is ajar, it's potentially open. All it needed was support. And for 36 hours, the New Zealand brigades hold Chunuk Bear. They're driven off the actual crest itself, but that becomes no man's land. 
Turks on one side, New Zealanders on the other, anyone who stands on the top is dead. The New Zealanders held and consolidated their position. And if it had been properly reinforced, this bridgehead could have been extended. On the 9th of August, Lieutenant Colonel Allenson's six Gurkhas, who had been clinging to the slopes of Hill Q during the night, attacked and gained a position on the crest. Had the planned attack from the New Zealand lines on Chunuk Bear been made at the same time, a critical breakthrough might have been achieved. Allenson's Gurkhas briefly saw the Narrows as they drove off the Turkish defenders. But before they could consolidate their position, British artillery and naval fire, which also caused serious casualties to the New Zealand defenders on Chinook Bear, drove them off. The Gurkhas broke and ran. Success or failure now depended on capitalizing on the New Zealand success. Now the flaws in Birdwood's planning were starkly revealed. On the night of the 9th and 10th of August, Two raw British battalions relieved the exhausted New Zealanders. They had spent the night wending their way up the slopes, and when they finally arrived at the New Zealand trenches, they lay down and went to sleep. If that attack was to succeed, it should have been backed up by hard, tough troops, possibly the regulars of the 29th Division, but it was unfair to everybody to put newly arrived soldiers, ignorant of conditions, untrained for anything except trench warfare on the Western Front, and totally new to being under fire. At first light the following morning, Mustafa Kemal, who had been placed in charge of the battle at Sari Bear, counterattacked with five regiments of Turkish infantry. It was all that was available. There was no resistance from the two British battalions, which simply melted away. Only the machine guns on Rhododendron Ridge stopped the British line from being driven back to the beaches. It marked the failure of the August offensive. And once again, it was the critical intervention of Mustafa Kemal that determined Turkish success. Kemal was absolutely crucial in the defeat of the attack at Chunuk Bear. Once again, he shows his great flexibility. He shows his great leadership skills. He shows the way in which commanders should always take an opportunity and exploit it to the full. Uh, by this time, he had gained some experience in fighting in the conditions that he found himself. And he knew how far he could push his troops. He knew what motivated them. And he knew, because they had already tasted success, that they wanted to taste more success. They wanted to push the invaders back into the sea, and he gave them every opportunity to do that. At Suvla, a successful landing was carried out on the night of the 6th and 7th of August by the 10th and 11th divisions of Stopford's Nine Corps. At dawn on the 7th of August, there were 20,000 British troops ashore, facing perhaps some 1,500 scattered Turkish defenders. Lehman von Sanders immediately ordered every available Turkish reinforcement to meet this new threat. Stopford had no faith in Hamilton's plan, and his divisional commander shared his misgivings. There was little coordination, and the landing degenerated into chaos. No water was available for the troops, and few knew what they were there to do. The Suvla landings were paradoxically relatively successful at first, where you see the British landing on the beaches and then throwing out their flanks um, to give them some protection. But what we see after that is a total breakdown of command and control. We see paralysis, we see stagnation. The Australians up on the high ground fighting for their lives could see people, thousands of people, milling around on the beaches at Suvla, only three, four miles away. Bathing parades, drill parades, football matches. Stopford, the commander of 9th Corps, was obsessed during the planning stage with Turkish opposition. 
He was convinced that the heights beyond Suvla would be held by the Turks and was very reluctant to, to push his men on up to the heights without artillery support. In fact, the heights were not held by the Turks. They were up for grabs. Only when prodded by Hamilton's headquarters was an advance made. But by then, it was too late. The opportunity to seize the high ground had gone, and the raw British forces, as raw as the Anzacs had been on the 25th of April, did not show the same initiative. 20,000 men versus 1,500 Turks. Had they been coordinated, sent forward, they could have seized the high ground and achieved their objectives. They weren't. And finally, when they were sent forward, they were cut to pieces. The failure to seize Chunuk Bear prompted one final attempt to advance at Suvla on the 21st of August. That too failed, as did Anzac attempts to seize Hill 60, a minor feature at the junction of the Suvla and Anzac forces. After the failure of the August offensives, Gallipoli became a dreadful anti-climax. The Dardanelles Committee had lost faith in Hamilton, and General Sir Charles Munro, who had commanded the 3rd British Army in France, replaced him. He was directed to assess the military situation at Gallipoli, and was shocked by what he found. No one who has stood on the beaches at Anzac or Suvla, or who has looked towards Achi Baba and the ominous bulk of the Kilid Bar Plateau, could be surprised by his recommendation that the force should be withdrawn. Kitchener came to the peninsula in November and agreed with Monroe's recommendation. In the same month, Churchill was sacked from the reconstituted war committee and he left the government. It seemed that his political career, which like the Gallipoli campaign had once been so full of promise, was at an end. There was an enormous frustration by the soldiers and the unit level commanders on Gallipoli because time and time again they felt there was something that was there for the winning if only the whole thing was put together properly and run properly because they knew that as soldiers they couldn't have given anything more and so yes there was a feeling that the higher command had let them down both on the peninsula itself in terms of their own core commanders, but also of Hamilton's staff. Birdwood now commanded the forces at Gallipoli, and his staff under his brilliant principal staff officer, the Australian Brigadier General C.B.B. White, planned and coordinated an evacuation, first from Suvla and Anzac Cove in December 1915, and then from Hellas in January 1916. It was conducted in total secrecy, with hardly a man being lost, to the stupefaction of the unsuspecting Turks and their German officers, who were lost in professional admiration. The Gallipoli campaign was a terrible strategic defeat for the Allies. It had promised much, but was never given the planning, attention and resources that an enterprise of that magnitude needed or deserved. It destroyed the reputations of its principal architects, Churchill, Kitchener and Hamilton. Yet in only five short weeks, Hamilton had planned and carried out the greatest amphibious landing in history to that time. He achieved complete tactical surprise but his hodgepodge army did not have the necessary skills to support him once they were ashore. It is doubtful that any army in the world would have done better, given their circumstances. The campaign in the Dardanelles and Gallipoli destroyed the cream of the Turkish army, which was never the same again. 
they put their best troops in at Gallipoli and they won, but at a terrible price. We lost a lot of ships, we lost a lot of very good men. We learned a lot of lessons, I think, from it. We must remember that Gallipoli was a learning experience, a learning experience about amphibious warfare, about what was required to fight in new First World War conditions, because we see, just like on the Western Front, the strength of the defence over the offence. And also, a lot of the divisions that were so carelessly, some would suggest, thrown into the battle at Gallipoli, came out, yes, having suffered considerable casualties, but actually they had been moulded into fighting units that could do very well later on. The Gallipoli campaign was a costly military, strategic and human experiment on the part of the British Empire. At the end of the campaign, 46,000 Allied soldiers were dead. Of 120,000 British casualties, 26,000 had been killed. More than 10,000 Australian and New Zealand troops would also never see their homeland again. Although no one can be sure, it is believed that 220,000 Turkish troops became casualties as they defended their country, with a very high proportion being killed. Gallipoli had been a disastrous bloodbath. Gallipoli had to be tried, but there was not the resources to do, to mount these campaigns everywhere. And in the end, you had to beat the Germans where they were, in France and Flanders. Mm -hmm.